we're getting to uh, discussing countertransference now. Cool. And, um, you know, I found, I found in my training um, that people were completely dishonest about this. Dishonest? Dishonest. That people were not, they're, they're more worried about how you're going to be judged, mm -hmm. if, if they would tell you exactly what happened in the session, um, exactly how they're feeling, thinking about the patient. Mm -hmm. and, and it created a climate of um, suspicion and, and um, you know, just a, maybe paranoia is too strong of a word, but you just can't be authentic. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, I feel that um, you need to embrace your countertransference when you have it. You need to really delve into uh, these, these reactions that you're having towards your patient because mm -hmm. it's communicating something mm -hmm. of, of, of not only about you but about the, the therapeutic dynamic in general mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course the patient's uh, conflicts. So, you know, facing countertransference counter honestly by looking at it as a normative or normal process for therapists to have mm -hmm. uh, is the first thing that you have to do. Um, so I, I have a, quite an extensive um, chapter in my, my book on this, uh, but I, it's also, um, it was also published in the Psychoanalytic Review called um, Countertransference Revisited, where um, I present uh, much of um, much of what's in the book. So, you know, Freud tells us we have to be aware of this. It arises in us, and we shall try to overcome it. Well, I don't think we can. No, it's, not a, it's, it's just part of a human process, a and it's an ongoing dialogue that we're going to have with ourselves and with others. Um, but Pretending or being in denial or, or um, allowing your own defenses to continue to operate is, is not going to be helpful for the treatment. Mm -hmm. So, there are so many different, uh, and there's no way I'm going to get through this, and I, 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 I want to be mindful of what probably is most important for your, your training experiences. Um, the, the, there's just such a compendium that, of, of different things that I, I've looked at in the literature and try to put together. And, and to be quite honest, it's not something that I think is obje objectively applies to everybody. It's that if you, if you go through this, you'll say, you know, I noticed that in myself, um, uh, but not all of these things apply. And they're not all going to apply uh, to all patients at all times. Mm -hmm. They're very specific. And the notion that um, something's being excavated in our own unconscious, our own, our own psychic uh, conflicts are being dredged up based upon what's happening in the here and now relationship. But there's unconscious communications that are always mm -hmm. happening um, and this is why I think the concept of projective identification is important, which I'm going to get to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it could be certain therapeutic enactments um, that you find yourself, certain type of habits that you find yourself into. So, you know, why? it's funny to hear, you know, just certain supervisees um, talk about patients and and so, um, you know, accepting what the patient tells you at face value, why would you do that? I mean, it's, it's, uh, there, there's always, I mean, this is just, of course, it's hard to say out of context, right? But um, there's something that you've, you know, you're just accepting what they're telling you as, as an unadulterated truism. 
it's probably not the case. It's yeah. probably there's probably been a lot of you know reworking of, of this narrative, and, and um, yet we can't really um, we can't be so blunt as to call them on on a bluff. But if you're listening, you know, the, with the third ear, as uh, mm -hmm. Theodore Reich would say, you're you're listening for that material back there. Mm -hmm. If you've just this is what it is. Uh, um, then you're probably going to miss things. Um, basic stuff, like how do you schedule patients? I mean, everything from billing arrangements to, um, uh, you know, I, I can just use my own experiences. I mean, arri arriving late for sessions, allowing sessions to go over time, not charging for no-shows or late canceled appointments, um, letting the patient accumulate a large bill. I mean, these are things that, like, why am I doing that? And we have to be mindful of the frame. Um, mm -hmm. I had a supervisee who um, was seeing a stripper um, and let her run up a two or $3,000 bill. Oh, my goodness. And, of course, she bolts from treatment. <laughs> so why would you do that? Well, there was a neurotic counter-transference mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and here's somebody who, who works in a cash industry basis. Uh, so, so things, you know, things like that. I mean, my first analyst um, trained with Beyond, and he was a senior. And he took me on as a student at a a very nominal fee, $35. And I started to notice that he, he would he would come late. Uh, one time he forgot to come to the session. Starts, he comes in the morning and he's eating his muffin and drinking his coffee. One time he fell asleep. And I had to wake him up and he denied it. He said he was jet lagged. Um, and and then he compensated by saying, "I want it's I want you to come in another time." And you, and I got to go to his uh, his condo, not his office, which was in the same building, by the way. So here I'm feeling special. Um, I'm in his house, you know, and um, and then the phone would keep going off, and then I have to you know I have to ask him to put it off, uh, turn turn off the, the ringer and. And then finally, I, I just said, you know, listen, I think there's some counter transference going on with you. And, um, uh, you know, I think you're resentful that you've taken me on for 35 bucks. He denied it, said I was narcissistic, <laughs> that I would, ha why would I matter? You know, that, and um, yeah, despite the fact that uh, it was not uh, the best experience, I learned a lot. Well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Got something. Yeah. And um, I learned how not to act. <laughs> um, get, getting back to um, uh, this, um, the, the, I think maybe it might be best, folks, if uh, John gave you the, the PowerPoint so you could see it on your mm -hmm. own. I, I'm just mindful of our time. No, so that's I, I, a good idea. I don't want to go through everything here because it's just too too much. Um, but just generally, there's certain types of countertransferences that are going to be peculiar to each of your personalities. Sometimes people are very passive um, and are they're easily distracted. Uh, you know, I'm bored. You know. If I'm sitting here and I, I'm having strong emotional reactions, and I, or I'm not even aware that I'm having them, I'm just, I remember a patient, I, you know, I wrote about it in the book, um, I'm thinking about, um, or let me, if you don't mind, can I have that? And I'll, I'll, I'll just read you this. This is a, a, this is a vignette. Okay. There we go. So, um, someone I saw a long time. A female patient of mine recounts her week. I listen with interest. 
waiting for her to arrive at particular conclusions. She suffered a great deal and still does, but prefers not to dwell on it. My interest turns into patience as she continues to talk, but circumvents her discontent. She's adroit at avoidance, but easily offended when I point such things out. Mm -hmm. I'd better wait, I think. I grew more aware that I, I must encourage her digressions. I feel frustrated. Getting farther and farther away, she skirts the issue with supple grace, then strays off into tangent, tangentiality. I forget her point and I lose my focus. And then I kind of get down on myself. The opportunity is soon gone. I glance at the clock as her monologue drones on into banality. I grow more disinterested and distant. There's a, a subtle irritation to her voice. A whiny, indecisive ring begins to pervade my consciousness. I home in on, on her mouth with aversion, watching apprehensively as this disgusting hole flaps tirelessly. <laughs> But, but says nothing. Yeah. It looks carnivorous, mm. voracious. Now Did you she, what page you're on? 207. 207. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now she is uh, unattractive, something I've noticed before. I forgot who my next patient is. <laughs> I, I, I think about the meal I will prepare for my wife this evening, then glance at the time once more. Then I'm struck. Why am I looking at the clock so soon? The session has just begun. I catch myself. What is going on in me, between us? Mm. Uh, I, I'm detached, but why? Is she too feeling unattuned, disconnected? I'm failing my patient. Uh, what is her experience of me? With some lament, I confess that I, I don't feel I've been listening to her. And I wonder what has gone wrong between us. Mm. Uh, I ask her if she has noticed. We talk about her feelings, our impact on one another, why we had lost our sense of connection, and what it means to us. I instantly feel more involved, rejuvenated. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and she continues, this time with me present. Her mouth is no longer odious, but sincere and articulate. She's attractive and tender. I suddenly feel empathy and warmth toward her. We are now very close. I, I feel moved. Time flies. The session's soon over, and we don't want it to end. Oh, you know, one question that when you were kind of asking with her about like where it went, do you remember any of like the content of what was discussed? Well, I, I or like was she kind of saying, "Oh yeah, I was just kind of you know going off on some obfuscating nonsense or whatever." Mm, to be honest, it's been so specific. many years yeah, ago. Yeah. Um, I took very <laughs> one time. I took very careful process notes, particularly because I write a lot. Um, and this is a woman who um, was hor you know, horribly suffered. So, and she was also a, a nurse and working in an environment where she's constantly around sick people. And um, so when, you know, she, she would literally just, the resistance, you know, avoiding, really talking about the level of her uh, pain uh, was very hard, very easy for her to be focused on other people's pain. But I can't tell you, I'm sorry, about the, um, the content at that time. I'd have to go back and probably look at my notes. Mm -hmm. Is this mine? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, passivity in the, se in the session that you notice about yourself, um, it could be that a lot of people are overactive. I mean, they talk too much. Therapists mm -hmm. are talking too much. They're, they're doing all the work. And that usually shows a sign of anxiety, mm -hmm. that they need to do something. They need to fix the person mm -hmm. rather than just sit with mm -hmm. the process. When, when you 
began to be reflective with her when you did say, I haven't been here, you know, I haven't, we're not connected. Did, between the two of you, did it fall on her that she was avoiding and that was causing, or somehow you were responding to that avoidance and that's how you construed it? Or did it, the Otis fall on you or was it equal? I mean, I wonder how that played out. Because I, and you didn't. No, um, again, I, this was kind of an impromptu uh, yeah. thing uh, I didn't plan to speak about. But, um, well, um, the way I, I think I kind of work as a more of a relational practitioner is that I, I take risks sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not knowing going to know what's going to happen. And so I was, one could say I was, of course, in an uh, counter-transference enactment along the way, catching myself, mm -hmm. and then I bring it to the here and now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of being focused on the past or other mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. it's between us. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then that allows for a realignment. Well, then did she say, oh, I've been avoiding? Did she own and then that freed it? Or, or I, I just went, because you described the movement, but I, I couldn't see where it happened. That's you know. yeah. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I you just can't. I can't remember the details. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I will. Uh, I think I'm going to present a, a, a tape, a vignette, to you, so it'll give oh, you okay. a good example of how I I, I try to deal with things that are difficult. Um, let's uh, uh, let, let's skip through this. Um, you know, other types, you know, like sort of passivity, anxiety that you might be feeling about a particular patient, um, but also negative feelings, anger, mm -hmm. a certain sense of negation, just like some of the vignette that I showed you there, frustration. The idea here is that um, you, you, you're carried away unconsciously by something, and how do you... How do you catch it, and how do you re-navigate back mm -hmm. into the therapeutic mm -hmm. encounter to make it, to make it uh, useful? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you show vulnerability to a client, they often see you as a real human being. Right. Um, if you're defensive about your defenses, uh, that usually just shuts things down. Right. Um, however, at the same same time. There are certain patients that are going to be very difficult for you, um, particularly those who have character pathology. And um, uh, I rem I'm looking on, on this and I see that arguing with the patient. Um, I remember a man who, um, he would, so, so when, when a person's angry or is an angry person in general, uh, or expresses it in session, it can easily m mimic or mirror uh, your own uh, anger about other things and it's being displaced. But I remember a man who came to see me because he uh, was a construction worker and he got um, mad at his uh, supervisor and he decked him. Whoa. So he was arrested and he was sentenced to anger management. <laughs> and so, and so the big, you know, big burly man, you know, a big beard, you know, kind of gets in there and his, his entire like, ah, you know, it's like this is his persona, uh, or maybe it's his core. Um, and he tells me, I, I went to go see some woman and she, you know, She's telling me how I have to think a certain way, and I, I'm arguing with her. And so, um, so here she, he's alerting me to another therapist who was a CBT person, right? Who um, arguing with the patient. This is like I learned. Anybody who's angry, I'm going to be, I'm going to be gentle bear, uh, and it's it's best to 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 be that way, uh, because. There's always something behind the anger, right. or underneath, or yeah, beneath. Um, eroticism. Um, 
So, so obviously, uh, in any therapist's uh, career, you're going to have to be dealing with intimacies. And that can easily lead to, um, you know, erotic feelings, uh, whether or not they are deliberately seductive, uh, whether they're just unconsciously brewing. And um, uh, we, we don't want to, uh, you know, sh shy away from, from exploring this. However, uh, since... Um, uh, since it's such a sensitive topic, it's interesting to see how professional ethics have changed. Um, there is a law in Ontario where if you talk about sexual matters with a patient, it can be construed as sexual abuse Ooh. under oh. the legislation. Oh, jeez. Oh. Now, wouldn't that, that just sh would shut down any kind of analytic process, That's wouldn't it? Um, and not only that, you have now a paranoid climate of um, men seeing women and false allegations being brought against them. I have a, a colleague whose life was ruined. He uh, was seeing a uh, you know, character pathology woman at um, his office, and it was after hours. She brings an act accusation against him. He worked for the VA mm -hmm. system, and they canned him. Mm -hmm. he, he, there, he had to get his um, uh, professional liability insurance involved, and they didn't want to um, fight it. They read our payoff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here, the man's career mm -hmm. was destroyed. Right. And um, to talk of, to t how is the law says to, again, to, what, to talk about? Sexual issue? How, how, how do you say that? Uh, that if you are talking about um, sexual matters with a client, it could be construed as sexual abuse under Ontario law. And it's just the way you might interpret that, uh, that clause. Is there, is, do they kind of give a, a, a way of a defense against it, like if you record, oh, I'm bringing this up for this reason, blah, blah, blah. If you have like a clinical rationale, are you kind of like, okay, or? Well, um, <coughs> let, let me use uh, uh, Jody Davies as an example. Jody Davies is a contemporary relational analyst who became very famous for a couple papers she wrote on erotic uh, enactments. <clears throat> she is um, having sexual fantasies for her patient, who sounds like from the from the article was a graduate student in psychology, mm -hmm. who was in training, and so she starts to confess to the patient her, uh, her sexual desire for mm -hmm. him, and and the probably late twenty something starts bawling, starts pounding his fist saying you're a horrible person, you should be arrested. And this is a good example of what probably would lead to uh, you know, be, me being charged if I did something like that. Okay. Even though there might be some reasoning for it, to bring it up, um, this is a good example of a, in at least my opinion, a horrible, uh, unnecessary self-disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, why would anybody confess their lust to their patient? Right. That's I, it just seems like a complete enactment. And then another paper. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, if, if she had documented something like this patient had this horrible, distorted body image and felt he was ugly and terrible, and she was able to confess, you know, I find you attractive. <coughs> yes, and that's, actually experience lust towards you. That, that's exactly the context. That was the context that was of that? Well, that he's fe yeah, he doesn't feel desirable to women and things like okay, this. And that, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still. It's too much. Uh, she did. She. It sounds like she kind of went over the top with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. what what do you think of the idea of saying something like, "Well, no, actually, you're kind of an attractive person." Well, what kind of dangers does that bring? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I I think really that, that you have to have a relationship that's developed. Um, and I'm more conservative about these things. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to to say that, um, you know that. Um, you know, you're, 
you know, you, you know, you're an attractive person, versus I find you attractive. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Um, Those are two different statements. Yes. And, and so it's another thing to talk, you know, say, well, well, tell me more about why you don't find yourself to be very desirable. Right. Mm-hmm. Versus I want to jump in and, and reassure you that, that you are. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess this is about, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm careful about self-disclosures mm-hmm. of, around certain things. Um, for instance, um, uh, however, <laughs> having said that, um, having a home office where um, I see people pr- uh, privately uh, in, I, the, it's separate from the house. I had the basement redone, and I had a door cut in the side of the house, so they enter in there. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not part of the house, but of course everybody knows my house. They come to my house, they see it. They know that I have kids. They know that I you know, probably hear cats running around upstairs. Mm-hmm. I try to see people when people are out of the house, but nevertheless, and if they're going to ask me uh, about my life, my personal life in that matter, I'll tell them. I don't, unlike in the past, when I was trained, it was a very stern frame, mm-hmm. Langsian frame. Uh, Langs uh, did not work for me, and I studied Langs. Uh, the whole notion of unconscious communications, which I'm going to get to hopefully, um, very important, but. The thing about, again, I, it's as if uh, you learn a learn approach or certain methodologies or you're taking, um, you're taking, a, um, I hate to use the word technique, but whatever, a- approaches that fit you and from this discipline or this one or this one, and it, and it seems to um, be congruent with who you are um, versus trying to imitate someone else who tells you you should be like this. When I disabused myself of that idea, it's like, oh, I'm free. Um, my, I, had a, I had an analytic supervisor at the uh, Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute. This you'll never, I just still in my mind. Um, so I'm, I'm meeting him for the first time. I'm sitting in a vestibule with other people other patients in their offices, doors. He comes out of his office, calls my name, get up, I go over. And uh, he, he goes like this to go in, not even a handshake. No. Um, come in, uh, you know, I, I'm not going like this, he's going like this. No, no even uh, if he saw you extend your hand, oh, yeah, yeah. he shunned oh, it. Yeah, oh, yeah. he's yeah. going in, uh, you know, very tight, you know, Freudian, yeah. stiff. He's a, he's a tight ass guy. <laughs> um, he opens the door, points for me to, to sit. I, I, you know, I'm saying, I, okay, hello, how are you? Da, 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 da. Come over, sit down, shuts the door. Then he goes over and sits in his chair and says nothing. He, just, he stares at me. And then, of course, I break the silence because yeah, right. I'm anxious. Da, 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 da. But this was um, the way he was treating me like a patient. Not like a supervisee. And I think, oh, I have to get through this. I have to play a false self. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing worse. And at one point, he, uh, I remember he says, uh, you're anxious. Brilliant. Now, this isn't the first time we met. I mean, this is over the course of me bringing cases. And he says, um, I said, well, I don't feel anxious. Uh-huh. And he says, you're petrified. <laughs> oh, jeez. So that's when uh, I said, okay, yeah. that's right. I have to get through. He's going to evaluate me. Right. Yeah, I was wondering if it's a hierarchical thing where... You, you yeah, oh, I'm a supervisee, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. And so I, I find myself, okay, I have to get through this, so I'm just going to bullshit you're myself. False self, right? And I, I just... I found that that's not the way you should be, yeah. and and you shouldn't be put in a position to be like that. Um, yeah. But he was a very uh, uh, classical 
trained person. I'm feeling so sorry for you because you've described one supervisor after another that's been really horrible. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, good, good well moments. Turned out. Good, some good moments, yeah. yeah. Stay away from those Freudians. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Well, you well know, I'm but, wondering at this uh, point in your in your as, as you are now, if you were in that situation now, I don't know, with or without the hierarchical risk, could you kind of confront that guy and say, you know, I think you're kind of, I don't feel like I can be myself and tell you what's going on. Is there's a problem with our, there's a problem. Yeah. I mean, is that a, is that an appropriate way to deal with a situation like that? Well, well, clearly, as someone at our age and mm-hmm. our, our level, um, I, you know, I was a. 26 year old kid. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, but at this point in your life, you'd feel like, yeah, you could, it might be appropriate to just be direct about that. Oh, well, Um, believe me. uh, Yeah, you wouldn't put up. I I wouldn't put up anything like that. I was thinking, when you say you can play false self, when you're doing it intentionally, consciously, and you know the difference, that's not quite false self, as I understand it. False self is unconscious, you think you're being genuine, you but think it's being but it's false. Uh, but it, you're imitating or you're not being true to yourself. So. Uh, that was um, persona more. You just yeah, assumed a yes, persona I, of a I, compliant I, student. I, supp- I suppose that's a more accurate okay. depiction. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking of uh, you know, Sartre's notion of bad faith. You mm-hmm. know, they, they, on one hand, I, I know that I'm lying, but I'm, but I'm betraying myself by by yeah. pretending. You're pre- betraying the part of you that wants to be seen as you are, yeah. but you understand that this person isn't capable of it. So is yeah. that, you're, you're protecting his, his too. His core yeah. self. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, it's his core self he's betraying. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, um, yeah, I, at the time, I thought it was a, a good idea not to you know, what? upset the apple cart. You I just wanted to get through well, the yeah, trade. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Look, you're, you're here now. You did it. You succeeded. You got in, in retrospect, that was the reality-based appropriate decision yeah. to make. It wouldn't yeah. have gone anywhere if you mm-hmm. had to right. put foot it, confront him, and yeah. call him right. on. Well, yeah, no, no, it wouldn't have gone over well. Um, uh, I did get revenge by giving him a shitty evaluation at the end of the year. Uh, but, but that's after I graduated. Um, the uh, thinking about um, the erotic transference um, and countertransference. I'll give you another example of my practice. Um, <clears throat> See, at one point I was seeing like, you know, 35, 40 people a week. And so um, during my productive years. Um, and so there's a woman that I remember. Um, and she was like, I think I only saw her for 10 times. She had like 10 sessions for her yeah, plan and yeah. you know, that type yeah. of thing. And she would come in and, and and she reminded me of some kind of like Barbie airhead. And and so that's kind of how I started like, you know, having this reaction to her. And and I I'm wondering what's going on with me here. I don't like this person. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. But then I realize that I'm she's coming in wearing a pro- evocative, provocative clothing, having mm-hmm. ma- massive cleavage, and has a boy toy that she's, you know, uh, got on the side, and everything is about appearances. And I realized then I'm angry because she's titillating me. And I don't, I didn't want to be put in the position of being, you know, uh, seduced or eroticized, which then led me to be able to approach how she must view men only for wanting her for her body. Mm-hmm. And, and that she has to, to be this way. Mm-hmm. And that, that, she couldn't see that she has other qualities somebody would want in her. And that led to, you know, I think, a bad reaction for her. Um, so that's an example, I think, is a, in my mind, 
-hmm. comes uh, around a, a counter-transference that was transmuted. There, of course, you're going to have so many different things here. Um, Did you ever bring up with her um, that, you know, what, what was her motive and, or was she aware of how she was coming across? Well, uh, yes. Only ten times, but yeah, no. The, the the thing is, is that um, you know, some it's kind of like a uh, more of a normative kind of socialization process for for a woman that if she if she's developed the sense of identity based upon her looks only, mm -hmm. and presents herself as a sexual object, uh, that's what she, that's what men want, and that's how she gets attention despite the fact that she's had a divorce, now is a, what would you call a, a cougar on the prowl? Oh, cougar, yeah. uh, You know, with the, that's why I said a boy toy. Um, in and out, everything's, you know, of course, on the internet. Uh, everything's dating and, you know, um, quick sex and all this stuff. It's an entirely different world uh, that I, that's transformed us, you know. Um, well, let's continue. Um, I do want to get to... Yeah, we are going to see the film. Um, I'm going to... Um, yeah, I'm going to play a tape. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, th I find the notion of projective identification very helpful mm -hmm. to work clinically. Um, so, the idea is that the, there's a process going on inter, intersubjectively between you and your, your patient. And there's a very, there's a powerful unconscious process going on where somehow you're, you're caught in the counter-transference, you're not knowing what's going on. But the notion of projective identification is that the patient is projecting certain aspects of their psyche onto you, and you're identifying with the behavioral fantasies that they are placing in you, but you're unconsciously identifying with it. So, hence the projective identification. You're unconsciously identifying with something being placed on you or in you, and um, now you're, you're reacting to it rather than seeing the defense that's, that's transforming in front of you. And that's why often <clears throat> when, you, when you're working with um, strong countertransference, it's not something that just happens right there. It's something that happens over time. Mm -hmm. And often when we get blindsided, we need time to reflect upon what's mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And when you reflect upon it, you can actually bring the material back into the session mm -hmm. in, at a future date. Um, but I think that this is both normative as well as leading to certain, you know, pathological instantiations. Uh, and of course, a character pathology uh, is where we often find ourselves wrapped up in, in these projective identificatory processes. Um, now, this comes from Kajdan, and I, I find this useful. Um, so here, uh, let's say there's four, he, he, he talks about four different types of projective identification. Okay. So one is dependency. Uh -huh. And there's a certain unconscious relational stance uh -huh. that, uh, that's being put or placed onto you. The dependent person is the helpless person. Uh -huh. uh, you, and then there's that unconscious communication uh, such as, yeah, I, I need you, I can't survive, and what's, what's, what do you do? You, you become the caretaker. Mm -hmm. So you, you, this person has a need for you to take care of them um, because of, of their own processes. So rather than um, looking at the dependency issues uh, with the patient, you're, you're kind of stepping in, taking care of them like mother. Uh, if we use power as another example, the issue here is who's in control. Um, is is the person like it could be the person who? The issue of power is that they are, they want to prove their powerfulness, 
or that they are powerlessness, depends upon what, what stance you take. But the more aggressive individual is like, I'm going to be in control of this. And if, if you've ever had a very difficult client come in and try to dominate the session or try to intimidate you, um, the feeling here is like, you know, geez, I'm not going to get through this. Uh, this person's too, too uh, mighty. And, and I feel like an incompetent clown here. And I don't like this person. A lot of people say, get out. I can hardly wait till they leave. You know, that, that, that's a very strong counter-transference reaction. At the same time, it's true that we're not going to like all our patients. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to work well with all our patients. Um, at, uh, however, if, if you've at least tried to manage the issue and, and, and deal with it, and if it's not workable, at least you've you've been, you know, you've taken a conscientious approach before you say, I'm going to refer you to someone else. I can't, I don't think we're going to work well together. Um, well, the chance to deal with this one this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, the one that you said yeah. today? <laughs> so, um, the, the uh, a sexual projective identification is like an example I gave you early, where I didn't want to, uh, you know, be put in a position of being um, stimulated or aroused by a patient, and I was resentful, but I was denying it as well. Um, ingratiation. Uh, the notion here is so here's somebody who's constantly like demeaning themselves, or they perhaps are very masochistic, and 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 you want to, you know, there's some notion of a self-sacrifice that's involved. And yet, the thing is, like, you, you, you owe me something. Give me something. And you end up feeling, um, needing to show appreciation or gratitude for a client when that wasn't really the context. Um, again, one might even look at that as a caretaking kind of stance as well. Um, the, here's the thing. When you have a projective identification process going on, that it stirs up, uh, you know, or at least think of it this way, as a hypothesis. It stirs up feelings in you. Mm -hmm. If you're fortunate enough to get a hold of them in the moment and, and feel them and, and know them, that's fine. Usually, though, it happens later, and then you bring it back in the session. But... When it happens, um, it, it's as if um, I, you start wondering whether or not the patient is feeling something, and they're placing it into you, mm -hmm. because it's too difficult for them to contain, mm -hmm. and they're in a moment of denial and disavowal or you know, projection. Um, so usually there's a heightened, uh, you know, heightened emotional experience is happening with you as the therapist. Um, whatever affect that might be. Um, uh, and then if you start speculating or having a hypothesis that this might be something that's happening between the two of you, then you can use that. And you can, you can use it in the, in the moment if you, if you catch yourself. But, but often there's like an, a, a signal affect. So just like uh, the notion of um, signal anxiety, that that when you feel, uh, you know, a strong uh, emotional reaction, and you might not know what it is, but at least you're aware of your body, your mm -hmm. thought, whatever, uh, that's probably a good indication that a projective identification is happening. Mm -hmm. So, how do, they, do you then use that? Yeah. So, the technical issue here would be turning this potential, like, counter-transference where you would act out into more of a therapeutic intervention. And for me, um, you know, keep in mind that I was originally trained in Chicago where um, Heinz Koha was very big. And um, I, at, at this time, uh, was very, very much into self-psychology before I um, 
got trained or had training with Merton Gill. Um, so how do, how do you turn a, a rift into an empathic attunement and engagement with the client? So if you're aware of these signals in your affect, in your self states, and you start to speculate, what I'm feeling in the moment must be what the patient's feeling, then you can throw it out there. You can use it as a bridge for empathy, mm -hmm. um, where they may, um, that, that, you, that you may be able to, to have them realize what, what they're projecting onto you is actually something that's difficult for them to deal with. Um, okay, I'm not going to get through these. So um, these are in the book. Yeah, yeah. So let let's that's a good opportunity then I think maybe now for me to play uh, a segment. Um, I you know, I'm just be honest. I I don't know what everybody's needs are the background, mm -hmm. and and this this is an ancient tape. Uh, it was during my train early training days, um, so I'm I'm young, but um, I, I I saved it because I felt like this is something that illustrates me catching myself in a projective identification mm -hmm. in the moment, mm -hmm. and then being able to um, uh, to use it more therapeutically. Let, let me give you a little background on the case. Um, I, again, once again, it's in it's in my book, um, but um, I was I was a uh, you know uh, third year I think I was third year doctoral student when I started seeing this woman, and I was at a I had a practicum placement for a year at um, a uni university counseling center in Chicago. And the woman uh, was older, like 30s, and um, I don't know, it was like 25 when I started seeing her. And um, she, <laughs> she was uh, trying to, in a nutshell, she was majoring in psychology. And she was taking a um, psychology of women's class, and she got into uh, uh, she got into an argument with the professor and told her to fuck off. The professor kicked her out. The, the dean the dean of the school said, uh, "You you have to go to therapy <laughs> if you want to stay." Mm -hmm. Well, um, at first when I when I first met her, um, she, it was like she's, as I recall, just so hypomanic and even pacing the room, the level of rage, the level of affect that I thought, is this person manic? Is this person that I, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted her actually to get a, see a, psychiatrist for an evaluation to see if um, maybe she needed to be on medication or at least to have a second opinion and then um, I, I brought that up to her gently uh, that I, you know the way she she's presenting and I'm concerned and and um, thought it would be a good idea if she got a consult and she agreed and then she came back for after that, the next session, she said that um, uh, she went to go see him. Uh, within a few seconds, she, she, she stood up, told him to fuck off, and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, now I know I'm dealing with a character pathology here. Uh -huh. um, uh, and the, the, st the way it went, um, in a nutshell, was that that first year was I was this, this idealized kind of transference figure. Uh, she, you know, she got to pour out everything about her abuse, her history, her failed marriage, um, her upbringing, um, and a lot of cathartic uh, uh, processes. 
And again, I'm working from a self-psychology model. So it's about attunement, it's about um, mirroring, mm -hmm. uh, it's about empathy, it's about attention to her affective states and being present. Um, so, um, however, I have to, um, uh, I, I have to move on. So, I'm done after my year, and I was uh, fortunately given an internship uh, at Michael Reese Hospital and Medical Center in the south side of Chicago, which at the time was quite a prestigious place and very competitive um, for psych, you know, psych students to get in. So I offered her opportunity to come to follow me there, which she did. Um, but not at first. She and her husband, um, had, uh, he was a teacher. Now she was a full-time student. Um, so he was supporting her. Um, he was a teacher, but he was also a jazz musician on the side and had gigs and bands and stuff. Um, well, uh, they decided that their, their apartment was coming up for uh, renewal lease. So they decided that they're, they're gonna move into another place and they put everything in the storage for the summer because he didn't have to teach and they were going to go visit his family for the summer. Um, well, when the fall came along, I think it was August, I'm wondering why the patient hasn't called, right? And she knew exactly where to call because I had made arrangements. Um, and I thought, well, I guess she got better. She didn't need to come back. And, and then I'm up on uh, the inpatient psychiatry unit and I get an emergency call for me. And I get there and it's my, my client who uh, is uh, suicidal. Mm -hmm. and she says, my husband beat me, I'm, I'm, I'm out on the street. And, and so I tell her to come and you know, get, in, get into a taxi and come to the hospital. So I get, like, I, I get her, you know, see her there in the, uh, it's an outpatient but emergency portion of the hospital and she's telling me the story and everything and what's happened and uh, he he's a drunk and he went from this idealized person to all of a sudden this this monster um, and uh, he was a drunk and weed head and, and they they had uh, that he had gotten around his family and started mistreating her and then beat her and she left um, and then she was uncertain whether she was going to be safe for the night. She's, gonna, she's talking about hurting herself. Uh, at the time, I was pretty naive, you know, I was an inexperienced person, so I didn't feel, um, um, I didn't feel comfortable with uh, making a decision around her suicidality. So um, I had called one of the psychiatric residents to come in for a second opinion. And here she's saying to me, she's gonna, you know, she's probably gonna kill herself that night. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the psychiatric resident gets in there and she's fine. Mm -hmm. She says she's fine? She's fine. So, I, I, and now I look like an idiot, yeah. right? Um, so I, I thank him and he leaves and, um, mm -hmm. and then I'm trying to, con you know, reconstitute her that she can come tomorrow and here's a time. And then just as we're doing that, she starts to say she's starting to feel suicidal again. <laughs> so at this time, I, I, was, I was, you know, irritated at being played. And I told her if, you know, if, if she continues to, to act like this, you know, where she's trying to manipulate me um, uh, by threatening suicide, then, then we're not going to continue to work together. Mm -hmm. And she was pissed. But she accepted the frame. Mm -hmm. um, of course, then when she came back, this is where the devaluation process started. I have become the abusive, abandoning, negative uh, therapist, uh, quote, slash husband. Um, so uh, at times, 
I remember this because uh, there used to be a commercial on TV where some guy's sitting in a chair and there's uh, speakers and his hair's, uh, you know, uh, flying back because of the, the sound waves. And so I, I always felt like I was riding the chair out, you know. You know, at, at times she would come in um, and just devalue me for the entire, almost the entire session. Um, she would yell. One time she was yelling at me so loudly that people came in the door because they thought somebody was being assaulted. Um, of course, she was uh, um, acting out in the, uh, with the staff too because she's supposed to be paying a very small nominal fee and she's, she's not paying her fee. Mm -hmm. And then she's mad at them that she can't see for free, and uh, which is out of my control. Um, but then, of course, I would get the displacement of that. So, um, at times, I remember, you know, like, this is, the, I hated going to, to, to work on this day, because this is the day I see her. <laughs> yeah. And I'm having, like, fantasies of me putting on my, my you know, shoulder pads and helmet. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, of course, I'm in supervision, right? Yeah. So, and because I'm in supervision, um, I, 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 I taped it because of my supervisor. Now, keep in mind the tape. To what degree is the symbolic other listening? Mm -hmm. The super egos over here. To what degree, and I wouldn't have thought about it like this now, but now I, I, I do. To what degree is she also acting out against the proverbial asshole who's back there? Mm -hmm. uh, and resentful that, that she has agreed to being taped and, mm -hmm. and all this and has to pay ten bucks and and that you've, I don't like the way you've treated me, and, and you're like oh, everybody else, da da da, da. So anyway, um, having sufficiently um, tried to contain this myself and trying to deal with things, uh, there's a particular moment in the, in the treatment that had uh, turned, um, uh, had turned from the devaluation period into much more of a, uh, I don't know how you describe it, on some level, mm -hmm. a more neutralized mm -hmm. area, uh, which then prepared the stage for, for actually doing some more deeper work. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see how this, uh, this thing works. How long had you seen her? How many sessions had you seen her when this gets taped? Um, well, I had seen her for a good uh, probably ten months. Okay. And then, and then she came in August. This is probably uh, probably around February, so about a year, a good year and a half okay. of work. All right. So the context here is still talking about um, she's still dealing with uh, the. Um, the dissolving of her second marriage mm -hmm. and yet it's in kind of the heart of the devaluation period and I'll, I'll play it through then I'll try to explain what was going through my head the dissolving of her second marriage? yeah she, she had already gone through a first marriage okay uh, and, and this second marriage is dissolving because the husband beat her yes okay yeah okay so let's see how this works Hopefully you'll hear it. Now, understanding what's going on through this is going to help you feel better about your life in general. Well, how about when I come in over smoking and good response to you? He's going to do any, do any good, so what's the difference? It was manipulation. It was like, you know, like the parts of me that are healthy, that are happy, that connect, that are very intellectual, that are very intuitive, that are very sharp multi eclectic able to deal with your people are to the psychological world. I can't. I can't. Maybe if I go over there, it would be easier because it's know. like coming right into the morning. Oh, that's it's hard enough. It's the speakers that are limiting it's the high end yeah. and distorting it or turning it down a little bit. Yeah, it's hard to do this. Okay. I'll lower it then. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay. Let me 
you back up then. Several times. Same. Yeah, but it's so low and it's such a pip squeak voice, it has no strength to it. So it must mean that I don't believe it? Right. It must mean it's weak. The intellectual after this. A bullied out of you because you could just give me something naturally, like you had promised to give me. So naturally, I bullied it out of you, regressing it out of you. Instead of it just being just something that nice, like I go to reach out to people uh, yeah. and uh... Karen, there's so many parallels between you and your relationship with Jenny and with me. Yeah. No, there isn't. Because you weren't there when I did all the loving good things. But you won't read the evidence about what a good woman I was to her. You're going to try to switch it as like I did in, in person, Jimmy, be out. Yeah, maybe I wanted Jimmy to love me the way I wanted him to love me, but it was the way that he had professed. And when I did it, I was dealing with lies and broken promises and fucking intimacy, distancing, and fucking drug and asshole, selfish, jag off behavior. That was fucking Jimmy's fault. It didn't matter who the fuck he was with. Let's get that straight right now. Now we can go into blaming me for whatever you want to blame me for. But that is Jimmy's shit, period. Jimmy had a shit long before me. That's why I would try to show you evidence of how he treated others who came before me, or his girls. But that's his shit, okay? He was also something loving. But what's really funny is when I'm not abused, like when I was with the berries, I'm able to heal. I'm less angry. I'm treated better because there's a little support and validation there, which is the normal fucking support that every human being needs is according to basketball. Okay, just normal shit. When I get normal shit without people criticizing me, judging me, or throwing their shit on me, and Jimmy was trying to make me codependent, that's the shit that was going on the time. Yeah. And my esteem was fighting that crap. I wasn't going to be another person so I could have my husband love me. That was the fucking guy there. So... And I guess because I don't always comment and respond and verify what you say, that, that, you, that you do feel that I, I'm not on your side. That I must think that it's your fault, you're to blame, and I'm going to throw it. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's just that it's a fact. Okay. 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 You know, the, you know, this is your classic borderline developmentally mm -hmm. traumatized mm -hmm. person, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's, well, I don't know if this is the time, but I heard something in your voice in that tape that irritated me in response to her that I don't hear here at all. <laughs> you were like, there's this soft, trying to be so nice. And I kind of identified with her. <laughs> Well, Not that I'm borderline or anything. I don't think there's anything wrong with us. <laughs> well, I guess I, you know, I'm now, you know, half the age older now. Yeah. But more than that. Yeah. Uh, um, again, uh, the context, I was in training, and mm -hmm. I was much more in a mode of, um, uh, you know, as a self-psychologist. So, uh, and I do have a soft voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was this kind of, I, I hear, hear it from other people, the trying to be sweet that I either projected into 
heard it, but I don't. You don't do that. No. Well, with that kind of problem in mind, I, I can see kind of see it two ways. One is it, it may have come across almost like sort of patronizing in a way. I, I think it's a word that comes to mind. Yeah. But the other is she's in this. What I, the term comes to mind is kind of complex discharging in her personal field. She's just spewing all this stuff out, mm -hmm. and you kind of really can't carry on a dialogue no, with her that can't. way. So I see you're kind of speaking really softly, like sort of trying to calm her down and bring her out of that, mm -hmm. too. So, it, But it can come off, it, I think that's what you're trying to do. It may have come off in this way of somehow overly, like as a patronizing or like too I, sweet I or can't, something. I, I can't kind of draw, it just, that in me, too. But, I just wanted to say, don't be so saccharine. But in my exactly. sense, is you just wanted to kind of have her calm well, down, be able to carry on a conversation. That but, but that, you know, exactly. Well, when I am angry, if someone is trying to calm me down, I respond probably with more anger because, yeah. I mean, you're afraid of me. You know, I'll give you something to be afraid of kind of thing. Well, <laughs> they're going um, calm down. I, I, I don't know. Have, have any of you had a, a patient who's that severe, who is, uh, you're a psychiatric nurse though, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, acute, you know, there were so yeah. many patients that were like that. They just would go, we, we termed it, they'd go off on you. Yeah. And it like had nothing to do with you. Of course yeah. not. But it yeah. was all yeah. about yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, you knew that, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't that educated about this stuff, but but it was, I, I mean, it was assaulting emotionally, and um, and it was um, scary at times, and it was like such a window into the distortions of their mind mm -hmm. that it was like I, I felt contaminated by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Well, and, Rogers and many it. times, I mean, not just not just a once or twice occurrence, but all the time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then even. Um, even like my last job at the VA on a unit with all, all kinds of programs, uh, we had patients uh, in all these different programs. Um, you would get, I mean, patients that really needed to be on the acute unit, and for some reason the doctors wouldn't transfer them up there. Well, uh, yes, I know. I mean, uh, you've, you're a, a war veteran. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I have PTSD. Yeah. I have some PTSD from it, actually. Yeah, I, I, I'm Mild, not surprised. Nonetheless. Um, uh, you know, in this context here, you know, like I've been seeing her for a year and a half, and, and this is kind of how, for a period of time, she'd present. Um, when someone's, you know, constantly yelling at you, swearing at you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, putting, you know, de you know dehumanizing you. Mm -hmm. uh, demonizing you, too. And Sorry, demonizing you. Well, um, uh, so here, this onslaught um, in, the, in this particular session, um, as I recall, um, you know, she's you know devaluing my voice, my sincerity. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there are all these demands that are being placed mm -hmm. upon me. Mm -hmm. Why am I not uh, being a perfect mirror for mm -hmm. her? Mm -hmm. um, and the distortions that you said. I mean, like. I, I don't even know where to begin to try to navigate. So at first, um, I, I did. I think I was trying to do a little reality testing. That I saying something like, "Well, I recall in the past saying these things about you," and then to, to another devaluation, mm -hmm. and then my counter-transference kicks in more, and I come back with the transference interpretation, which just infuriated her, mm -hmm. trying to trying to compare how she's acting with me like she did her husband mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then that set her off and and that's when I realized you know geez you know that I uh, I'm, I'm taking this in and she must be feeling what I'm feeling mm -hmm. and that's when I, I said you know I acknowledged when I don't say these things that she's she must feel it's her fault I, I'm invalidating her mm -hmm. and that's when she started you know sobbing Got it. I hit the affect, and mm -hmm. and that help let a let a reparative moment happen. Um, as I recall, things started to level off after the, after the session, mm -hmm. that it, it became a little bit better. Um, but uh, we never take uh, things at face value. Mm -hmm. Turns out that. Um, she, uh, 
later confesses that um, she was in a drunken stupor with her husband and she slapped him and he slapped her back. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to uh, the breakup. She um, came back to Chicago when he stayed at his uh, family's house. She got in the storage unit and she um, took all his uh, vintage guitars and pawns to a pawn shop. Mm. Sold them off. Took all oh. the crates of jazz albums. She stood on the corner uh, by the Art Institute of Chicago and just gave out LPs to anyone walking by. Oh my God. Oh. Then she starts to stalk him when he came back. She threw a brick through his window, oh. the, the car. Oh. She contacts the IRS saying that he refused to report income based upon his gigs on the side. Oh. She contacts his employer, who is a, um, it's a Catholic school system, to let uh, them know that he's a, a drunk and, mm. and uh, he should be fired. It sounds like a fatal attraction, really. Well, he had to get a restraining order put on her. So um, this is the kind of level of disturbance, mm -hmm. and um, it led. Uh, this led to, however, um, a termination because I graduated. Yeah, you, but I, she, you, she followed you, didn't she? Well, this that's is early, this yeah, earlier. Separate. That's yeah. earlier. So this, I got my doctorate and I got hired at a at a university. So I I'm moving down. And so uh, I we. I count myself lucky. <laughs> well, there you go. See, this is a good example <laughs> part of, the of, of yeah. that. We, the, yeah. These are folks that are um, very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But we did have, um, I, I think, for, for given the level of pathology, we had a good ending. Um, or we had at least two months to talk about termination. Because uh -huh. I, I did get a job that was going to start in the uh, academic year fall. Um, or in August or something, and um, we talked about her two years of working together and what she needs to do, and and uh, there were moments of recognition. She gave me a gift uh, as appreciation, um, and so for the most part, uh, given that this is probably the most difficult uh, client I had yeah. um, at that time, and when I played this to other supervisors they said that's the worst uh, that's the worst borderline I've ever heard mm -hmm. yeah I mean th these are the type that you're in, in you know you're an inpatient you know not an outpatient well, I've got a better one, but... well um, you know what do you do I mean like yeah. uh, you know Winnicott talks about hate in the countertransference mm -hmm. I mean uh, or self-hatred okay. self-loathing I not you know like at this point I don't know how I would act toward a, a patient like this but it would probably be rather paternal. Uh -huh. It would probably be that uh, that's not acceptable. Uh -huh. um, you know, they do they do respond to limit setting, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things about a psychiatric unit is the structure, uh, the behavioral structures that you put in place. Sort of, at least this is the way it seemed to me that it um, it was more of a container for mm -hmm, them and they, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. had some limits and they were able to adapt to that better. Um, but it's a yeah. tough go, even even given that. Oh yeah. It's a really tough go. Mm -hmm. Well I, I mean And most of the time they're just sort of like medicated. Yeah. Chemically restricted mm -hmm. just in some ways. Which well, isn't you know, isn't optimal. There I mean given that again you've been on the front lines uh, mm -hmm. uh, and um, suffered uh, combat f fatigue, <laughs> at oh, the yeah, very least. Part of, part uh, of my masochistic uh, <laughs> acting out. <laughs> well, uh, now you know, come to understand that since I retired. I, <laughs> oh, so we, at least you've retired. At least mm -hmm. you, you've got a reprieve of all this. Um, in my in my years uh, in in patient psychiatry, I mean, all of the psychiatrists were depressives. All the psychiatric nurses were just traumatized people. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, like, they take it out on the first, like, the first responders, people right there. 
-hmm. but um, a group a group therapy sessions um, like in my book uh, there's a I was treating a severely disturbed man young man and um, who um, he had he had the word pain tattooed on the back of his neck in, in old English script mm -hmm. and um, he was like a punker punk rock mm -hmm. kid you know that type of thing just nothing but seething rage and anxiety and panic attacks so he, I started to see him individually and then he he came to one of my group sessions and then there was a particular nasty uh, well accomplished borderline woman who did not like me and um, who was very similar to this one and just started going going after me yeah um, you know devouring me swearing get you know everything you piece of shit da, da, da. and the guy <laughs> the the new patient I just started seeing said shut the fuck up bitch he's my friend you needed him before. And, and, well, not, now this isn't good here because you know we need some safety here. Everybody else is now frightened about violence. Um, so, it's so important on a psychiatric unit that the team is cohesive because then all of you together mm -hmm. can back up a certain mm -hmm. staff that's being mm -hmm. attacked. Or that person can step away, and the other people can can kind of mm -hmm. then deal with it and calm yeah. it down. Yeah. But well, boy, when you, but that. you see a lot of pathology among the staff because mm -hmm. they, yeah. you know, it's hard to get. I mean, there, there's there's conflicts between staff, so that you know most of the so time when something yeah most of the time when something, yeah, yeah. The time when something like that would happen, that staff would put their differences aside because they knew if, if I want you to be there for me, I got to be there for you this time. Right. But um, but that didn't always happen. Yeah, no, no. Um, it's almost like it's almost like a primal setup, you know, like a jungle scene. <laughs> well, um, yes, I'm sorry to hear that you had to go through it, but um, uh, so it sounds like you've survived, <laughs> which I is have, important. I've gotten tons of insight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what but, we stopped so it was what shut up. Do? Fuck up, bitch. What happened? <laughs> oh, well, it led to, you know, me needing to realign the group and you know, talk about safety here. It's important not to get out. But she did calm down. <laughs> um, but, but, but it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny that the, major, the majority of um, fighting that I witnessed um, were, were women. Who were attacking mm -hmm. the nurses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't men, and mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, you, usually when I, because I have a soft voice and I'm fairly bigger frame, I, people will calm down with yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And I cap, I, I think I capitalized on that approach. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a woman who uh, is is threatening the unit she was in a room everybody's afraid to go in there she had some objects she was gonna hit people with and uh, she already assaulted somebody and I, I walk in and and she's doing this and I, I say um, you know you're scaring people and she just put it down and I said let's you know, sit down on the bed and talk you know that type of thing but of course anyone who's got their eyes set uh, on a juggler <laughs> Well, we'll go after it. Um, and uh, again, poor nurses just were, they were front line. Well, because they're, the nurses are the ones that have to implement the structure on the unit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's certain certain rules that are supposed to be yep. followed. And um, and the less you, you, you sort of implement those rules, mm -hmm. the more chaotic the unit gets. Oh, sure. And yet if, if staff are not doing it, equally, then you become the target. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I thought that, um, uh, you know, I just, I think it's good to learn from mistakes and hear mm -hmm. other, how other people work, even though this was mm -hmm. many moons ago. Um, I felt uh, as a training, uh, you know, training tool, but, uh, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. worth uh, playing. So most of this most of this type of severe pathology goes back to attack clinicians. 
Yeah. I, I, I think it's unequivocal, mm -hmm. uh, especially the patient I presented. I mean, as she put it, she grew up in an emotional concentration camp. Mm -hmm. you know, this person? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Father was a horrible, you know, abusive person. They were, um, she called herself bohemian, uh, so I think she was Eastern European, uh, immigrants, mm -hmm. um, coming from a hard background, mm -hmm. um, older brothers that would bully, tease, you know, devalue, and uh, never felt really loved or mirrored. So, um, this sounds like a naive question, but anyways, so are you saying that most borderlines um, have this kind of early damage? Well, um, again, you know, it depends on, on what kind of developmental traumas they would have gone through. Right. Um, some, you know, it just depends what, what qualitative yeah. aspects are. Not everybody, of course, is physically abused, uh, uh -huh. uh, but they might feel emotionally abused and may feel like they were never, they didn't even exist. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and everyone has a different qualitative way of organizing their inner experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. once again, I've never met anybody who didn't have some form of developmental pathology early, uh -huh. early in life who presents like this. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what is the reasonable um, expectation of some kind of um, uh, some kind of therapeutic result with someone like that. Is it like long term? I I think the yes I think the you know people with personality disorders uh, do better over time if they stay yeah, with you. I've heard mm -hmm. that. If they I stay, know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very, it can be very That's tenuous. Uh, you know, narcissists. Uh, will bolt the minute they, they don't have a mirror, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, more aggressive type. I mean, again, these are just typologies, right? We can just call them, you know, personality disorders in general rather than all these little divisions. But um, I, I do think that ultimately, uh, you know, borderline apathy is really something that is about basic splitting and fracturing of the psyche. Mm -hmm. And that um, that's a common thing I think for for all of us. It's uh, these are de these are developmental precursors. So you were talking about you know the division in your dream, right? Um, that you have a negation. The way we think, the very the very process of thinking itself or thought itself is to introduce divisions. Mm -hmm. Is to which, Contrast. which immediately is a negation. Mm -hmm. It's introducing differentiations, mm -hmm. and it's now having to then reintegrate in the mm -hmm. psyche. So, um, on one level, this is basic to all of us, and on the extreme form, is this need to keep good and bad so is so separate rather than having an integrative um, narrative. Mm -hmm about both self and other representations. Mm -hmm. when was I, the what dream was this? Didn't you talk about a dream when we first came in? Yes, she did. She did. She did. Oh, I just said I had dreams. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, yeah. I, that I needed to process. Yeah. That mm -hmm. was it. Right. Well, you, I thought you mentioned that you had... Um, dreams of tunes. Yeah. Tunes. Oh, yeah. That, oh that, oh, that was, that was years, okay, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. Okay. Well, I think nice we hadn't thought about it like this before, but that perhaps another way to look at that is about countertransference. You know, the, the two and not negating one over the other, but kind of holding both. I don't know what else I wanted to say about that. I was kind of off the cuff. But what I was thinking was um, I appreciated... Um, I always do, whoever is talking about kind of transference, I find it very helpful um, in looking at the clinician's response or feeling reaction um, to the client at the time because I find it to be very informative. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes difficult, you know, for some of the reasons that you kind of alluded to or stated that um, we, just, we sometimes don't want to admit that to ourselves. You know, we're feeling a certain way, we want to posture, we want to look good to our colleagues, or, you know, something like that. 
Um, Roger gave a, a really nice example of that yesterday in his class. And, and I just wanted to say, I appreciate your sharing that because I find it to be very helpful mm -hmm. and kind of another way of, of giving information about what's going on and how to be, in your words, useful or therapeutic to a client. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good. Some of the ways of structuring that. thinking about those reactions and what they mean yes. is very nice. It's a very yeah. lucid kind of way of looking at yes. it. It's, I think it'll be very useful. Word. to yeah. um, That grid's in the book, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, um, yes, Rose. This, um, this idea that um, borderlines uh, suffer from an early pathology. Um, I'm struggling with something here, so I need to sort of struggle out loud. For some reason, I thought that borderlines had some kind of chemical pro problems or deficiencies or and to it's an interest. I don't quite understand what's going I, on. I can there. try to respond to that if you want. There's some reason to think that people who, in those difficult, traumatic early situations, who end up developing borderline personalities may have a more reactive, kind of emotionally labile constitution. Mm -hmm. And I think that may be what you're referring to. So there may be a constitutional. Um, Propensity. Tended propensity mm -hmm. towards that kind of thing, and conceivably that lability might react, elicit reactions from the people that are interacting with. So there may be, I think that's the current thinking, is that there's some tendency towards emotional lability. That's yeah, kind of, because I, you know, I, for some reason, you know, I think of trauma as something that happens. I was going to say outside of us, but no, it's not. It's happening inside yeah. of us, mm -hmm. and. Um, God, the more I am in this problem, the more, the less I understand. Well, well, years ago, we did the neurology thing, and the one thing that I remember from that is emotional experience. What if it's positive? It changes the brain in integrative ways. Physical, you get a physiological yeah, response yeah. from a good and the terrible emotional yes. physical experiences yes. changes the brain and it becomes less integrated um, less functional and I'm guessing that would be a borderline would have experienced so much trauma right. that their brain their, their neurological system is actually physically damaged well and, and especially in the early like I think in the book John you, you said the, the first seven months are crucial with attachment sure and, um, okay. and, it's, and that's when so much of the brain structure is like rapidly growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, mm -hmm. I mean uh, let, tell me if you find that useful because how does brain discourse, um, uh, you know, translate to what you would say or do in the treatment? Because oh, I'd have some, I'd, I've used, after that neurological thing we did, that was quite a while ago, what I can, um, and from doing, um, oh, I, I'm trained in EMDR, and I, um, what's his name, um, the guy that first started presenting the evidence of the changes in the neurological changes in the brain, Shore. Kessel Van der Kolk or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, after seeing his, what I can honestly say to a client is, especially if they're starting and they're, I say, you know, as a result of our conversation right now, both of our brains will be just a smidgen different. And I can say this is absolutely substantiated in the MRIs and the CAT scans that the neurologists are doing after a series of therapy sessions. But you're using that as a way of appealing to their psyche because they have a model that understands their psyche in those materialistic terms. Yeah. But you're but still dealing true. with their psyche. You're not, you know, that's... I'm you know, saying there's hope here, but I'm also saying... That's what you're saying. That, so. Yeah, but I'm also saying that I'm involved, too. That I I am changed, too. Which I also take from Jung and understand that to be true. Well, um, yeah, but 
I guess, uh, is, you know, um, neuroscience, I mean, again, CAT scans, CT, uh, functional MRIs, that's not consciousness. Mm -hmm. no. That, that, oh, uh, no, it's not so, so that's not the way we experience our subjectivities. And um, some patients may like to have a didactic uh, lesson so they can, you know, kind of think of uh, in terms of the brain. Others, I'm sure this one, would fly off the handle. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Oh, no, 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 not that. You know, a lot of people come in with He's these models. That they come in with them rather than sort of being educated. But they come in with this assumption that they're, this, that they're determined by the material functioning of their brain. Actually, to me, it's more of a problem to get them out of being too stuck in that. It's kind of, you know, they're it, so it, reductive, it, they're reducing themselves. And our culture sure supports it. You know, it's all in their own They're going to expect that more from you, too. You know, yeah, they roll on it. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's another thing I do along this line. If somebody comes in and says, I say, why or what brings you into counseling? And if they say something like, I just want to be happy. And I say, yeah, oh, I said, well, I say, I think I can pretty much give you a money back guarantee on that. And they go, well, and I say, well, yeah. And I do this in two parts. And I say, um, I don't have a crystal ball, actually, so I don't know how much happier you're going to be. But you might only be just a teeny little bit happier. But you might be a whole lot happier. We'll just have to wait and see. And I, I mean, oh, and they just, <laughs> that's why I had 16 clients in two days of work. <laughs> anyway, but then the second part is at the end of the session, I'll say something like, I mean, if it's gone well, you know, and this is an intake thing, I'll say something like, um, I just, I just, I'm just curious here. Can you kind of float back? to how you felt when you first came in? And they'll say, yeah. And I say, and then, is there any difference between then and now? <laughs> yeah. And I'll say, did it. <laughs> then the, and I'll say, what's, and they'll say, oh, I feel better. And I'll say, well, what do you make of that? And they'll say, well, you know, you're, I know you, or you're not so bad, or I thought I wouldn't like it. <laughs> A transference <laughs> cure. I, <don't> know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it better. That's also, you know, that's, I swear. Also di a, that's also a, a, a didactic um, relationship uh, cure. Mm -hmm. It's from relational. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I couldn't. I so, had I'm, I'm, I'm mindful, folks, that we, we need to stop for lunch. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see you in the next section.